And for our next talk, I would like to welcome Misha Frankly to the stage to tell our first of two talks this evening about the kind of people who tell these stories. And he is going to be telling the story called Munchausen by Proxy, Confessions of an Honest Liar. The story is a Baron von Munchausen, a uh, real, real person, fictitious character, something in between. Uh, Misha. An abrupt change in programming. <laughs> Darling, Misha couldn't make it. No, I, I thought I'd come myself to, uh, you know, tell me about myself. How do you do? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. I am the Carl Frederick Hieronymus von Munchausen at your service. Now, having heard for the first time that my adventures have been doubted and looked upon as fiction, I feel bound to come forward and vindicate my character for veracity's sake. This I have been forced into regale. Oh, wait, this. This I have been forced into regale of my honor, though I have been retired for many years from public and private life. I hope this talk will place me in the proper light with my readers. Like many nobles of my generation, I was born at an early age. <laughs> in a log cabin I helped my father build. The date was May 11th, 1720, in, this, in an estate in Bronwerner, Hanover. That's in Germany. Being born of landed gentry in my time, I acquired many names and titles. Initially served as a page to Prince Anton Ulrich von Brockenwe... I don't know. <laughs> and later as a lieutenant and finally a cavalry captain with the Russian regiment in the Turkish Wars. That's me up there. Ha a much younger version. Uh, I was even present at the first siege of Ochakov a siege by the Russian forces upon the Turks during the Austro-Russian-Turkish War. It is said that our first Russian attack was repelled with heavy losses, but as a result of Russian mortar fire on the houses within the fortress, fire broke out, and on the second day of the siege, the powder magazines within the city exploded, uh, killing an estimated 6,000 defenders. Yeah, well, thereafter, the forces, the Turkish forces capitulated and the ensuing slaughter, all but 3,000 of the garrison were killed. The stench of decaying corpses was such that the uh, Russians had to withdraw within 15 miles of the fortress. Disgusting. Um, is there any way to increase the size of this? My eyesight isn't what it used to be. No, no, down here, I, the letters. Could we make the letters bigger? I like in beginning. There, there we are. Thank you very much. Annette, everybody. <laughs> now, soon after reaching my rank as captain in 1760, I retired to my estates as a country gentleman and became famous around Hanover as a raconteur of extraordinary tales about my life as a soldier, hunter, and sportsman. I often regaled with great pleasure tales and fantastic stories of my adventures in Russia to my neighbors and friends in the Hunter's Pavilion constructed by myself in my own hometown of Bodenwerner. I, often called, I was often called a master storyteller and expert improviser, which is completely true. Unfortunately, this fabulous and incredible pavilion, which I was so proud of, subsequently, subsequently became known as the Pavilion of Lies. Yes, I know. Since my tale included the then thought of impossible feats of traveling by sleigh, pulled by a wolf to St. Petersburg, traveling to the moon in a storm, finding an island made entirely of cheese <laughs> in a sea of milk, and flying across the sky on a cannonball, amongst many others. These tales were not just of myself, but others as well. In fact, I often spoke of my remarkable horse, Bucephalus, 
uh, my tales were well, well remembered and loved. Uh, but my hometown has a statue of myself and my horse in the middle of the town square to remind them of my great adventures. Now, you probably wish to know how this very interesting event came to be, and I shall tell you. The swiftness of my Lithuanian steed enabled me to be foremost in the pursuit of the enemy. And seeing the enemy fairly fly through the opposite gate, I thought it would be prudent to start stop in the marketplace to order the men to rendezvous. I walked my panting Lithuanian to a spring in the marketplace and let him drink. He drank uncommonly and with an eagerness not to be satisfied, but natural enough. Hey, are we here? Sorry, I'm learning. <laughs> How do I scroll? Oh, yes, two fingers. Oh, there we are. Technology. I don't. What is this newfangled science you speak of? I, I have no knowledge of it whatsoever. Ah, well, he drank uncommonly with, and with an eagerness not to be satisfied, but natural enough, for I looked round to my men. What should I see, ladies and gentlemen, but the hind parts of the poor creature, croup and legs, were missing. Ah, uh, as if he had been cut in two, and the water ran out as it came in, without refreshing or doing him any good whatsoever. How could it have happened was quite a mystery to me till I returned with him to the town gate. Uh, there I saw then what I rushed in pell-mell with the flying enemy that they had dropped the porculus, a heavy metal door with sharp spikes on it, uh, unperceived by me, which had totally cut off his hind part. That lay still quivering on the outside of the gate. <laughs> It would have been an irreparable loss had not our farrier contrived to bring both parts together while hot. He sewed them up with sprigs and young shoots of laurels that were at hand. The wound healed. <laughs> and what could not have happened but so glorious a horse as Bucephalus, the springs took root in his body, grew up and formed a bower over me so that afterwards I should go upon many expeditions of the shade of me and my horse's laurels. <laughs> All completely true. Now, during my time of regaling my numerous adventures to my friends and dinner guests, I had the unfortunate displeasure of meeting and being introduced to one Rudolf Eric Rasp, pictured above. Yeah, what a bastard. When Rasp was a resident at the University of Gotten Game, he obtained, in all probability, through my relative, Gerlock Adolf von Munchausen. Adolf, a name not very much used nowadays. <laughs> a great patron of arts and literatures to the university, an introduction to myself, and at which my hospitable mansion at Brodenwerder, he became an occasional visitor. Rasp at university had become known as a versatile scholar and student of natural history and antiquities. His burgeoning renown and friendly connections helped Rasp attain a position as curator of the collections belonging to Frederick II, sorry, the Landgrave of Hesse-Cassel, as well as a university position overseeing antiquities. For a young gentleman seeking an influential position and an offer could not be bettered. Now, did need to keep himself in a fashion suitable for a respectable member of the court and to display and to repay debts accrued during his days as a library clerk and chaser of impressionable young actresses. Yes, what a rogue. Led Rast to begin pirating away selected pieces of the Landgrave's collection, which he pawned. The easy private access proved insatiable and he had soon embezzled the equivalent of two years' salary. Upon discovering, Rasp fled to Holland and then England, where penniless and in a poor social standing. In his desperation, as a measure of a contempt for which he felt for Frederick II, sorry, and his class, Rasp penned a collection of satirical tales starring an impeccable gentleman. Yours truly. His first petition, penned in 1785 was thusly titled, Baron Munchausen's narrative as his miraculous travels and campaigns in Russia, humbly dedicated and recommended to country gentlemen. Really, one? Oh my, well, there we have it. So, the little regard which this impudent knave showed me <laughs> may fall under suspicion. However, there was a German poet by the name of Gottfried August Berger and soon became a popular book. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, it tarred my reputation, and it ruined me, and I died, or oh, so it said, an incredibly joyless death. However, upon my death, I soon found an incredible joy and immortality it brought back to life. In fact, I guess you could say, I was reborn. <laughs> Looks a lot like me, doesn't it? Our recounting of my tales and reputation proceeded to grow after the publication of these books and tales being added through the years. Uh, instead of becoming a horrible liar, I became somewhat of a folk hero. Uh, nowadays, my tales are not nearly as well known in the English-speaking world, but mostly through Germany and Russia. Ah, uh, there we are, and Russia. Uh, throughout the years, stories have captured the hearts and minds of children and adults. Though seemingly fantastic, the incredible tales were not mocked as they once were, but embraced as fascible storytelling, such as the time I found myself crash landing on the moon, twice in fact, and my subsequent descent to Earth by rope. The time I met the great Katharina, the great of Russia, a most impressive lady, if I do say so myself. My befriending of the, Rus uh, sorry, the Turkish Sultan and my... I did befriend him. He, actually, he enslaved me, and I kept his bees for him, but that's another story for another time. And of course, my many, the public's fascination with the tale of my flying across the sky in a cannonball. This tale seems to ignite the imagination of people and artists across the globe. Multiple versions of this tale of it exist, although I admit I never recalled undertaking such a journey. But it could be something to do with the public's fascination with my gigantic balls. <laughs> uh, many filmmakers have told stories of my life. Uh, the filmmaker Georges Méliès, he was French, you know, who greatly admired my stories, filmed Baron Munchausen's Dream in 1911, and of course my stories might have even inspired his 1902 tale, A Trip to the Moon. Even the Nazis couldn't resist their own tales of my own gigantic cannonballs. And in fact, they had a German movie made in 1942 in Agfa color, whatever that is. And uh, Goebbels made this movie, if you can believe it. Strangely enough, not political. He was trying to make it his own Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Meh. But of course, my personal most favorite ferret celluloid tale of my tales was a relatively recent collection by the man on the left, Terry Gilliam. <laughs> also known as the American Monty Python. And if you have not had the pleasure of doing so, I urge you to go find a copy of this film and watch it post haste. And if you've never encountered this film before, let me the first to tell you, you're welcome. <laughs> Unfortunately, my name has uh, been taken to mean various other horrible things. You may be familiar with Munchausen syndrome, a mental disorder in which a person repeatedly and deliberately, deliberately acts if, in, if he is physically or mentally unwell when he is not sick at all and he just wants to gain attention. That's horrible. This is Ashley Kirklow, a notorious case in Canada, wherever that is, of Munchausen syndrome, she was 18 years old when she began an elaborate scheme to guard her attention and money by faking breast cancer. Yeah, repulsive and completely ignoble if you ask me, or even worse, Munchausen by proxy, where the abuse is on another person, typically a child, in order to seek sympathy or attention for their abuser, something I consider horrible and shocking, especially when my noble name is associated with such a horror. Uh, and finally, it is also used in modern parlance to describe Munchausen's trilemma, a thought experiment. It's a circular argument, you see, uh, where the theory is supported by the proof. Uh, it could be a regressive argument in which each proof requires a further proof, or a s axiomatic argument which rests on accepted principles. Oh, sorry, fingers. Considering this is an argument based on the philosophy of logic and debate, I am proud to say... I have no further comprehension of this matter whatsoever. <laughs> and thus, in closing, if you are in fact interested in learning more about my fantastical tales and adventures, I invite you to read the slightly exaggerated tales of my adventures in Rasp's book, or even better, you may personally attend the Great Dickens Christmas Fair held yearly in San Francisco during the winter season. Five weekends from Thanksgiving to Christmas. 
and witness the spectacle yourselves as performed by a troupe of illustrious actors of some renown, performing a tale as told in traditional British style Christmas pantomime. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. And so, let us raise a glass bottle, whatever you're holding in your hand, as I give you this quick toast in modern that encapsulates the Munchausen tradition. One fine day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came and killed those two dead boys. If you don't believe this lie is true, ask the blind man he saw too. Salute!